time and I spent 36 years slapping NER. Now I isn't. And she looked at me and she said, you? And I said, no, I'm Bill. And she said, you're too liberal. And my answer back was I said, New York, you know, New York thinks you're too conservative. Meaning, as you go around the country, one of the messages I'm learning is this is a huge country. And to try to create a consensus on a presidential candidate isn't going to work. So bottom line, they create the realtor party. We're getting close to the end here. They create the realtor party. All right. About 2008, now we're getting to the good part. About 2008, they take some of that money, that surplus money, about $2 million of it, and they create the program called Campaign Services. Now what's that? We're going to talk about that. It's on your sheet. They go out and they do a lot of things. They hire vendors, and they, we're, you're going to learn all about this in a few minutes. We hired pollsters, vendors, we bought voter lists, we bought all of these tools that are necessary to elect realtor champions to office. And we use dues dollars to do it. Okay? So you're going to see a list of things we're going to go through that are things most of you have never used or ever seen before unless you've actually run a race. Some of the gads have seen them. But we bought lists, we got, you know, how to do postcards, how to do elect people. We did all of that, okay? 2010 comes around and there's a case called Citizens United versus FEC. And Citizens United changes the whole world. And okay, and this is where I think, stepping back, some of our friends who are the realtors got a little over exuberant. When they got up and they said it's going to change the world, they never really explained what it meant. And to many of us, like myself and you, we said, oh, if it's going to change the world, we're going to get a lot more stuff or things are going to change. What, what changed? Well, what it did is it was a revolutionary court decision that basically said, you know, corporations and unions, you can give unlimited amounts of corporate money to these independent expenditure things. Well, NAR is a corporation. OAR is a corporation. Local boards are corporations. So all of a sudden, you could take dues dollars and apply it to things for soft money purposes. Okay? Now, if you don't understand all of this, and I still got you in the dark, you will at the end. But this is where it starts to get fuzzy, I think, in looking at all of this. Because if we didn't understand all of this, what was so revolutionary about it? I wasn't doing it in the first place, so if I'm not doing it, where's my 40 bucks going? Well, it's going toward these campaign services, because then there's another case. In this case, I just learned about, and it's called basically Speech Now versus Federal Election Commission. It was in the Wall Street Journal about a week ago, and it said, meet the parents of super PACs. You see what's really important, you guys, is these two cases. And this is, a his this is something you can go home and talk to your partner with, or have a cocktail on. These two cases, based this one particularly right here, allowed that guy in Vegas to write new $5 million checks. Because what people are confused about is they think the Citizens United case changed the way individuals can give directly to campaigns. It hasn't changed it. You can still only give $5,000. But this case right here, basically here's what it did. It simply said, you individuals, Mr. Rich Guy or Mrs. Rich Guy can give unlimited amounts of money, like a corporation or union, to a super PAC, who then can do an independent expenditure, and as you probably heard on the news, carpet bomb some guy, like they did to Newton, Iowa, and everything else. Okay, I'm looking at a lot of confused faces. This is the whole, here's the point. In 6970, we started with hard money, our PAC. We're really good at our PAC stuff right now. We have very little depth and understanding of soft money politics. And that's, we're going to talk a lot of, all of these programs we're going to talk about, a lot of these have to do with soft money politics. So <coughs> electing the mayor, doing voter lists, doing all this other stuff that we're talking about, we don't currently do very well. So. The, the message in the bottle here is why they came through, and I'm now finally understanding this a little better. The message of why they came forward and said, boy, we, this Supreme Court case was earth-shattering, and your life is going to change unbelievably. 
And we all looked at him and said, how are we going to get a short sale done faster? You know, what, what, are our members going to make more money? Where's the connection to doing a deal? There, there isn't really. The connection is politics. And as you walk through 012 and you watch this election, the 3.6 billion that is going to be spent on the presidential election, and by the way, this is the First Amendment right, and by the way, it's not going to change no matter what you see, because when Obama said, I guess I'll take a super PAC too, yeah. we're now nuclear. Both sides have it. And in 010, and then we'll get on to the program here, in 010, the Republicans said, we'll play with the new rules, and the Republicans, you saw Schumer sort of going up and saying, this is wrong. You remember this president turning to the Supreme Court justices and saying, it's wrong. And they got their butts clean. And if you pick up USA Today, if you look at the FEC reports on these super PACs, less than 10 people have given all the money to the super PACs, who are millionaires and billionaires. So you sort of shake your hand and go, somehow that RPAC $25 thing ain't cutting it. But the reality of it is, it's, it's a right, and you know, when you talk to all the constitutional scholars, the only way this would probably change would be a constitutional amendment, and passing one of those in the modern world today is almost impossible. So, I'm gonna slow down here. The message is, the playing field for politics has changed. So if you're only a hard money organization, you just collect our PAC, Give the check to the candidate, stand up at the board meeting and say, isn't he great? The president shakes his hand. Tell your members who to vote for because you've given it to Bob. That's what we do really well. You're not going to be very effective in another few years. The only way you're going to be effective is instead of just giving Bob the check, he's going out and recruiting Bob to run for mayor, just like Gavin did with city council people determining the campaign plan for this guy to run for mayor, doing maybe an independent expenditure on behalf of the person, polling on behalf of the person, and here's the major thing, not just telling your members who to vote for, but telling the public on behalf of organized real estate who to vote for. Because you want to elect a realtor champion, not with just an RPAC check, but with all these tools we're going to talk about. So you'll hear a number of times today I'll come back and say, remember 6970? Here's where we are today. So in a nutshell, in this first 30 minutes, I have to almost take the first 30 minutes and then stop here for some questions to try to explain, in my mind now, what this program is all about and why they did what they did. I believe a year or two from now after this 012 election and 014 elections, we will look back and say it was one of the smartest things we ever did to reposition all three levels of the organization to use these tools because people on the other side are going to be doing it. So think of it this way, what we did in 11 is the same thing we did in 1969. And we're stumbling along right now because a lot of us don't know how to use it, we don't know how to do it, and we can't connect the dots and explain it to an average agent or a broker. And the only way we have to explain it sometimes is when we lose. So I believe, and then I want to open up for questions, the biggest frustration that AEs and realtors had is how can I explain this to the members when I don't even understand what all this stuff is in the first place and what all these programs are. So let me stop here and then we're going to start going on some of the programs. Questions about that, the background of it, the selling of it, what's still the mystique to you about it? Because we're, we're going to go, the programs are going to help you answer some of the things that you raised. Yeah, Bob? Bill, is, is this the soft money, and I hope I have my terminology right, is this the soft money that, that we give to a candidate, <coughs> it's kind of hard to explain, we, latch, we, we like candidate A, okay. and, but we cannot do anything in conjunction with his or her campaign, but we can do things on our own. In their, in their behalf. Okay, well let me, and, and, and Paul and Fletch and some of the other guys, I want you to help me answer these from Ohio perspective. The, it, his question is, we can do something for a candidate without the, you know, without their consent, okay? That's only one sliver of this program called the independent expenditure portion. 
And again, I want to make sure that the folks here can explain, and Gavin too, from the Ohio law perspective, what you can do. Because that, that description you just gave of what you have to do in affidavits and disclose is different in every state because it's controlled by an election law. Your state is very open season. <clears throat> What's that? Which we love. Yeah, which we like because you have a lot of flexibility to do this without a lot of this agony of, you know, do the directors know, don't they know, you know, all this other stuff. So to answer your question, Bob, that's just one tool. As we go through the programs, you're going to learn about what are called campaign services. We have polling, we have voter lists, we have get out the vote. We have a lot of different things that you can do to support a candidate beyond an IE. I, can't be. These are a whole series of things that we have to offer you if you want to get involved in an election. Yeah, why don't you just stand up real quick since we're right hot on it. When we come back to that, why don't you explain what, what you guys did uh, and some of the services you use locally? Yeah, um, last year I contacted Jerry Allen, who's um, at NAR, said we'd be interested in doing a pilot test program of this. The reason being is Columbus City Council races cost between a half million to a million dollars. Uh, per candidate to run. So our check of a $10,000 RMAC check doesn't get us a whole lot with them. So I said, can we do something more? Can we spend uh, some of this money for an independent expenditure to try it? So um, sat down, got an approval from, um, I forget what committee this is, the RPCC committee, with the committee that reviews this, they approved a uh, plan for us to do. So we did a um, Republican and a Democrat picked two candidates that we would support. Um, and did a mail campaign form, did polling, uh, but we operated outside of their campaign. So I didn't tell them, there is a thing, that I can't go tell them, hey, I'm gonna do three mailers for you, we're gonna cover these topics. Um, now I could have given them the polling, I could give them the stuff after it goes, so once we finish it, um, but I don't have, you didn't have to sign an affidavit, I didn't have to say that we weren't gonna tell anybody, they just tell you not to do it, more or less from federal law. Um, but there's no filing disclosure, stuff of that nature afterwards. So we were able to run the campaign um, separate of their campaign, but also still give them the RPAC check and do that on top of it, in addition to the independent expenditure that we spent um, between, I think we spent some on poll and then we did three mailers for one candidate and then two for another, so. And what, so just to chop it up and, uh, and then we'll, we'll start more specifically on the programs, just to give you an idea what he's talking about, did you hear him say, we gave him an RPAC check, okay? So that's one, Bob, that's one thing that we do already, okay? Then they said, we've decided we want to do an independent expenditure. And what people don't understand is they go, well, what, what is it? Is it like a check going to the Board of Realtors? Is it like a check going to him? You know, what is it? Well, when you do an independent expenditure, it's usually services. Did you hear him say polling? We'll go through this. Did you hear him say sort of like get out the mail pieces, like those things you get in the mail that says, Bob, you know, vote for Bob, your wife. there's language like that. Um, there's voter list, you know, targeting people to say vote for Bob. All of these little services add up to a dollar amount. And in his case, in his case, I think it was uh, $57,000 that they got out of this service for all these things. Well, those went to, and, and they, do they typically go to the vendor? Or the uh, yeah, we dealt with um, a local <coughs> vendor for one of them and then an NAR vendor for the other guys. So. Yeah, so the people that did the, you know, the polls and the people that did the mail, all that stuff, that money went to those people. And see, this becomes really foreign to people if you've never done one of these before, but this board got back $57,000 of their $40 they were kicking in because they decided to do this program. We will show you other ways to use a lot of these services if you want to do that without the independent expenditure program. So, Bye, that was a long answer, but the bottom line is the IE is simply just one silo of stuff that you can do. And uh, when we get to that, we'll show you the amount of money that Ohio gets, the state gets, and the, and the local gets. <coughs> Anything else about the program? Yes, please. Just a question. So, for instance, you sent out flyers. Now, did, it, did the flyer state the, the certain board or you know, the realtors great, great were supportive go ahead. or do you want to be yeah, no, go ahead because we'll go right into we targeted it. Um, for each candidate we get a different list that we targeted. For example, the one Democrat um, candidate, he was council president who would win, so we just targeted highly likely to vote Democrat voters in the general public. Mm -hmm. um, it was all actual rate tenant order uh, the pieces were all about jobs. So it didn't actually touch on realtors. 
um, but it did state at the bottom, this is paid for by the National Association of Realtors. Um, so it did tie in just by the disclaimer of it. Um, but again, there was no specific language that was for it. We just wanted to move as many votes as possible. So it's so. done separately from the candidate having Correct, to and we go. didn't coordinate with them at all. Right. Like, yeah. What, would there ever be a time where something got sent out that maybe the candidate really didn't approve of the way it went? Or, you well, know, they, yeah, the candidate didn't approve of either of these pieces. They didn't right. know we did. Okay. They got in the mail just as time as everybody else did. So, okay. Um, okay. You know, we coordinated a message. I mean, I worked with the vendors to coordinate a message. Okay. That's what we came out with the whole and come up with. So, and, and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna go right into IH now. But the the answer so everybody's really clear. And hopefully it'll be a little more clear than mud at the moment because I'm looking at some of your faces. We're going to go through it step by step. You don't need to say realtors on that. You can create your own line. They, they only did it because they were a test case for NAR. And NAR is a 527. They use their 527. You don't need to. You can create something. And I, I have a recommendation for Ohio and what I'm trying to do around the country. Um, because really, got gang. In, 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 a, in a nutshell, this program called My Realtor Party, which is a really nice program, it's way too big. As I go around, what really has to happen and why we're here today, because I'm, I'm, my guess is you'll have some follow-up meetings after this, you really have to create a My Realtor Party Ohio. Because your law is different, you have different relationships with uh, you know, your boards, you have a certain amount of GAD, some have more, some have less. And so it's really a culture of, the way I look at it is, if Ohio had 26,000 members and you all paid 40 bucks, all went into NAR, what's the best way collectively between the boards and the state you can get your money back out of this program? I mean, that, and that sort of, goes, yeah. Well, uh, can you, I think, at least for GAD purposes, we've all seen the printout or the spreadsheet that shows Ohio's getting this much money. Yep. How does that play into all these various programs? Okay, we're gonna go through that right now. Okay. So here's what I need you to do. If you go into your packets, you'll see uh, there's, a, there's a sheet that looks like this, which is, it says uh, menu of services, tools, and resources. And that's gonna be sort of our glossary or index for the day. That, that's, your, that's your main sheet. My Realtor Party menu of services, tools, and resources. And over on the right-hand side, it says issue and candidates, and it says candidate independent expenditure races. That's what we're gonna talk about. Your next two sheets should be a little set of charts. There's two pages there. One starts with, uh, it says grants and independent expenditure schedules. Okay. And this is sort of a really important piece. Someone said laminated. Why, and this is why you can tell I came from a local or state environment, is I went to the NIR staff and I said, I want to know every chunk of money I want to know when they have to apply and how much they can get. I said, because local boards and states have committees and they have deadlines, and if you want them to apply for something, you need to tell them when to apply. So we're going to go through this chart. And then the last one we're going to get to is where we get done some fun stuff here. There's the next one, which is a little map of the country. And you see Meredith's green states there. Then we get down to the fun one which is the last two, which is simply a uh, listing of all the states with two columns. That should be the last two pages. Okay? We go to that last page and look for Ohio. Everybody there yet? 26,570, 134, 845. On that chart over there? Okay. They want to circle that because that's all you really care about. Circle that one. This last chart, past the, it's past the map. It says 2012 state local independent expenditures, second page, go to Ohio. Put your finger on Ohio, run it all the way across, membership, and, and circle that. All right, let's talk about the, let's talk about the, the new program. How, let's start with how do we come up with the number? I really didn't know for a long time. <laughs> Here's how they came up with the number. NAR, every October 31st, this is important that you write this down, on October 31st of every year, NAR will do a census of size 
of every state association in the country. So for some of you from the larger boards and the state people, you know on July 31st we determine our national director count. Well in this case on October 31st every year, NAR will do a count. So last October 31st, NAR was at 1,010,000 members. And Ohio was at 26,570. What they do is they take the the total amount, this isn't that important, but it's just to get you the number. They take the total amount of money that's allocated for the independent expenditure program and they divide it into the million ten, one snapshot. And for 2012, the dollar amount is $5.09 a member. That one you want to write down. So if you take the 26, 570 times 509, that's how you get to the 134, 845. That's the amount of money, Paul, here's the answer to your question. This amount of money is exclusively only for the independent expenditure program, which is your allocation. The allocation, ladies and gentlemen, is split 50-50. Half of it is reserved for all the local boards in Ohio, and the other half is for the state association. January 1, 2012 to December 31, 2012. Now, here's all the questions I get. First question, okay, if it's split 50-50, and I'm the Columbus board, and I got 2,000 members, do I get 2,000 times 509, and that's my money? The answer is no. There's no allocation at the local level at all. It's just whatever that half is. Next question, well, if that's the case, who's gonna determine that Gavin isn't getting all the money and I'm getting some money. We'll get to that in a minute with a form. Third, 50% at the local level is only for local races. City council, aldermen, whatever. So if your assembly person is in Columbus, you don't get to give it to your assembly. You only do local races only. State level, you can only do state races only. And constitutional races. Everybody with me so far? Here's where it gets interesting. What about federal races? Doesn't count. NER has a separate program for IEs for federal. So forget the congressman, the senator, they're not in the pet. This isn't part of that at all. It's just local and state. Next question. Okay, you know, it's a nice program, but uh, we don't have any local races this year. So why, what am I supposed to do with my 50% of the money? Why we have My Realtor Party Ohio, and every state is different. If all the local boards, said, all of them, said, we're not gonna use the money this year, we'll give it all to the state. Because they got a big constitutional race they wanna do. 013 state says, we don't have anything cooking. Well, we got four big mayor races in Columbus, Cincinnati, Cleveland. We'll give our 50% all to the locals. You can do that internally. The only problem is this. If one local says no, it doesn't work because there's no formula for every local board. But I can tell you that in a number of states, very close to here, that decision has been made simply because it just made more sense. Or they had a statewide candidate they really wanted to throw all their money at, and the candidate was so important that it didn't make any difference or there weren't any local races or anything of that nature. That's a choice you guys will have to make internally. Okay, so the next question on the IA program is, if you got it split, how long does this money last? And then we'll get into the application form. The money is set January 1 of 2012 to December 31st of 2012. That's the cycle. Okay, next question. You know, I'm a local board, and I ain't gonna use the money in 012. Now our members paid the 40 bucks. So what happens, we go back to NAR and pay the light bills? No, the way it's set up right now is, let's use the, let's use the most dramatic example. The entire 134,000 you didn't touch at all this year. Well what happened is, it rolls over into 13. So you start with 134 whatever. <coughs> but this October 31st, we're gonna take another census. How many of you think NAR is going to be still be a million people? Hmm. 
I don't think it may not be. It may only be 980,000. So they got to run that same formula again, and instead of 509, maybe it's only 470 times, maybe only 25,000. So let's say for the fun of it, Ohio gets 100,013. You add that 100,000 onto the 137 you didn't spend, you now have $237,000 sitting in 13. This is now if you didn't spend a dime. Okay, the next question is, what happens at 14? Puff, the magic dragon, it's gone. AEs in the room, help me on this one. How many programs would you give out money to in 14 if you don't know your membership size? It's just too far out. So at the moment, the money is lockbox for you for two years, 12, 13. What's going to happen in 14? Well, if you look down at the bottom of that sheet, go down all, run your finger all the way down to the bottom, and it says, add annualized NAR reserve pool and run over your number there, it says 1.7 million. 25% of this money is actually in a reserve pool. And my guess is what's going to happen for all that money that may not be spent, and I think there's going to be a lot of it in two years simply because of the sophistication of this program, it'll go in there and then it'll probably be reallocated out again in 14 because NAR starts their three-year budget process 14, 15, 16, and my guess is we recalibrate all of this 14, 15, 16. So then the next question you ask for particularly the GADs in the room, What's that reserve pool for? Who gets that? The reserve pool is set up that by some chance, and let's use the state as an example, somehow you're going to get involved with some big statewide race and you're going to spend all the money. And now it's October. And the, the legislative team says, if we had a little more money, we could put this guy over the top. You can come back and ask for money out of that reserve pool above and beyond this amount on a case by case example. So that reserve pool is designed for people to come back and use it if they think they need the money in a calendar year. So let's stop here and let's do the Q&A on where we are because then we're going to go to the form and how we apply for the money. But that's, that's basically how it's set up. You got 137,000 and again, remember I said about 45 <coughs> minutes ago, it's the only amount of money that is truly allocated. This is yours. Everything else we're going to talk about is on a first come, first serve, case by case basis. <coughs> Anybody got a question on where we're at? Bob? Okay. If you take $40 mm -hmm. times the number of agents that we've got, real mm -hmm. in the state of Ohio, yep. and I may, no, I may be wrong. Weren't we told that two thirds of that money would come back to the no, state? No, and that's, Is that thank a myth? You. that's a myth okay. and, and, the, the, and another factoid that didn't go right. Okay. Two thirds of the money was the entire program. So here's the other one. They said, well, if you multiply it all out times five years, 40 bucks times five, it's a $200 million program. And so we're going to get two thirds of the 200 million back. Well. What they did is they took a spreadsheet, and because they said this program is 12 to 16, sort of like a four-year program, they just hypothetically filled in a dollar amount, <coughs> filled in the blanks. In this case, they used 478 for the IEs, and they just went across into the spreadsheet. Because everybody's asked, but the, you hit it right on the head. The other myth was, if Ohio gave in 400,000 because you had this many members, you were going to get two-thirds of the 400,000 back to Ohio on a state-by-state -state basis? And the answer is no. The answer is it's two-thirds of the total program is set up to roughly the 26 million out of the 40 million, <coughs> and it's designed to go back. The only individual amount that's allocated is the IE right here. The rest of it is you're competing with 1,400 local boards in 49 other states and four territories for the money. I will guarantee you nobody understands. Well, it took me five months to figure it out. <laughs> but that's, that, was a, that was a fallacy that every state was going to get back two-thirds of their amount of money that they paid yeah, in. Exactly. So thank you for asking that question. Exactly. Uh, so in other words, it's, it's, a, it's a myth now that... Say that again? It's a myth now that it wasn't sold that way, correct? Well, I don't, you know, I don't know. I, I have to tell you that I was running the state in May, 
And uh, I was there for the vote in May, and I didn't come on until October. I never had the belief that two-thirds of the money was coming back to Wisconsin. In fact, I know it, because I brought all the GADs in the 80s together in August before I left. And we had a meeting, and I said, how are we going to figure out a way to get all of the money back? And we, were, we came up with a plan, and this is why I believe it should be My Realtor Party Ohio. Is I turned to Mike Thiel, my successor, and I said, we're going for issues money, we're going for grant money, we're going to teach all the boards how to get the maximum of every grant possible, every RPAC money possible. See, I had a philosophy running Wisconsin, and I know Fletch knows me well enough, is that if NAR had a dollar, I'd suck it up. So when the Ira Gribben grant came out, I turned to our people and I said, I want 80,000 bucks back to Wisconsin. So for a little state of 13,000 members, I got back 150,000 last year in issues. And by the way, I don't, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but your, uh, your state association kicks butt. They get a lot of money back. So my, my point is, is that, is that collectively, what I'm trying to do is change the culture and almost, re, and almost force the boards of the states to come together and say, if we've got 45 programs that AIR has, how are we gonna get the most and maximize use of these programs for Ohio? And we're gonna go into some of the smaller grants you know, in, in a little bit that'll be important to you. But the answer is no, there, there's no way 40 million could go back individually. Think about California, 160,000 people, there's no way they're gonna get back that kind of money. So, you know, the perception, Bob, I, I, I can't solve that one. I mean, the, the party's over March 31st, the dues are in, we're, you know, we're moving on, but that was the perception, you know, and, 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 and that's how some people took it, they took it that way, it was never designed that way though. Because there's just, it's impossible. I can tell you mathematically, it's impossible to give back two thirds of the money for every dime that Ohio paid in. It's just impossible. And I was struggling to find ways in Wisconsin. We paid in about 427,000, you know, for this membership. I was trying to figure out a way how I could get 400,000 back. No way. I got myself up to maybe, excuse me, two, 300,000 with all the grants and all the rest of the stuff, but just couldn't do it. Yes. Jennifer. So after 2013, that's so they're only, only guaranteed through 2013. You know, then I want to make so I can explain this. Mm -hmm. Then after that, there'll be a recalculation based on new census. And yeah, my guess is what they'll do is they'll, and this is just a guess, video guess. Um, October of 13. <laughs> October of October of 13. Um, my guess is that they'll do a census in October of 13 and they'll recalculate it for maybe another two years again. But remember, here's, this is why, this is why, where Meredith comes from, they only have a constitutional race every four years at the state level. So imagine Mary Antown, who runs the state association, what she's gonna to say to NAR when, wait a minute, if I don't use the money in 12, 13, and I can't use it, you're telling me I lose it? However, you do and you don't, because at the same time, and this is one that I think is really important. We don't know the depth of what the capability is, GADS, listen to me. You don't know what your capability is of using all this money at the local level is yet, because you've never done it. You got one board that used $57,000. Imagine six or seven cities in Ohio that used $57,000 for mayor races, alderman races, whatever. And this, you guys, <coughs> is what is the most challenging thing for me. And Bob, it's one of the reasons why it's so frustrating about and sell this is, if you don't have the capability to use all this stuff at the local level, I'd be frustrated too. I was never frustrated because in Wisconsin at the state level, we did IEs all the time. And I knew all these programs. And I was already calculating in my head how I could use polling, how I could use this, and I could actually put a fiscal note together. If I'm a local AE right now and my board of directors turn to me and say, how are we going to use these campaign services for mayor? And they go, Sandy, you want to calculate for how much are we going to get for polling? How I wouldn't know how to answer the question. I'd be mad because I've never done it before. So I, you know, I, I'd be very curious, maybe just start with some of the GADs and, and Fletch. I don't know in Ohio how many local boards are going to be able to use some of these services we're talking about here, let's say the half of the 135 that we just talked about. You guys tell me, in 012, how many of you local boards are going to use half of this money? Could you explain the function and what is a GAD? I'm sorry. 
Doug and Affairs Director. Yeah, I mean, I know that. I know. I, I, I'm, sorry, I'm so bad at that. I'm really sorry. What are they connected to? How do they get that? How do they become one? Uh, well, a government affairs director, a government affairs director is like a local lobbyist. Some boards have the ability and the budget to be able to hire a staff specialty person who is in charge of the government affairs programming, lobbying, and political programming at, at the local level. So uh, I can tell you across the country, uh, in Wisconsin we were fortunate we had seven or eight. We had different ways to do it. Uh, there are maybe, how many gas? There's about 250 take out the states, so there's about 200 local gas. 200 out of 1,400 local 400 boards. boards. Which is another reason why I argue you need My Realtor Party Ohio because I think it's a perfect way that you can collectively come together and maybe share resources. But I can tell you, the infrastructure for doing some of this stuff isn't there in many of the boards. It just isn't. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to make an excuse or be apologetic. This is what I'm finding out traveling the country. In Iowa, they have a state GAD, and she does maybe a few races. They do primarily just giving out our pack. And they have no local GADs at all. Not one local board has ever done a local race, and they have like 30 boards in Iowa. So where do they start? They got, you know, 60 grand sitting there in an IE fund, and they've never done an independent expenditure. And they're just sort of looking at us saying, what are we supposed to do? And that, I think that, to me, that's the message I have for you today, is that there's a lot of good stuff here. We're getting to it, I promise you. It's only been an hour. There's a lot of good stuff here, but most of our boards, probably 98% of our boards have never used this stuff. It sounds like a major planning process between the state association, or state entity, and local boards, and forward planning. Absolutely, and I'm going to tell you this, that in the end, and I've told this to Mo VC and everybody else, do not judge this program because we didn't spend the $7 million IEs. We're going to spend the issue money. We're going to raise our pack like you wouldn't believe. But I think on this IE program, it's not going to be a lot spent because, first of all, there's five or six states of which election laws are very prohibitive. You can't. And then there's other states that would be similar to this where not one local board except for one in a test case has ever done an independent expenditure program and probably won't in 012 because they don't have the capability to do it yet. So, I mean, in my case, my suggestion is Gavin works with Fletch and Paul, and they put on a program for boards. They bring in Meredith. This is poor woman. She's not be able to talk yet. She's going crazy. <laughs> bring in Meredith, who is the consultant, and she works with Fletch and the team, and you put on a program on how to use these services in Ohio. I mean, that's where I think we are. And can we do it yet this year to get a couple done? I don't know. I'd have to ask your, your local folks. Jennifer, you got a question? Um, again, and I come from a board small enough definitely don't have staffing, but I want to understand what's the benefit of the I, using an IE as opposed to you know, doing it without the involvement with the candidate's actual campaign? I mean, is it just to get your message out to more people? I mean, there has to be some benefit. That's, that, that's, a, that's a great question. And I, uh, uh, Gavin and Mark and Paul and some of the guys helped me on this. Her, her question is, in a local race, even though you could do all these campaign services, you could poll, you could do mail, you could do all that stuff, what do you guys see the advantage of using an independent expenditure for? Because you can truly affect how the race ends up. I mean, your your pack check will only get you so far if that goes directly to the candidate. Now you're doing something above and beyond that because now you're advocating for it. So but, but take it even take it Actually, even further. Go, go ahead. One of the one of the best examples for most people to understand federal IEs. Okay, and that's what actually has existed. So you everybody sees the commercials, and now we're coming into a presidential campaign. You're going to see commercials by a gas company, an oil company, and you'll probably see them now. They're talking about the candidate and how the candidate is on that issue, and it sways voters. So that's the one of the biggest things is getting out there and getting out to a certain voting population. So when Gavin did it in Columbus. <coughs> They focused on certain packs of registered voters that they were trying to sway to go for that, you know, vote for that candidate who maybe were not so sure or you know where they wanted to go. And then they heard they were really great on you know police and teachers or whatever it was, and that was that one thing that pushed them over the edge. And you don't work with the candidate at all because you don't want them to know either. It's, it's usually you're supporting them. Or you're you know because NAR doesn't do negative by the way. Just as, as one side note, um, and I know that was something that Gavin had had uh, 
I talked with them about too. And so, but you're talking about trying to push voters a certain way and, and really, you know, especially at the local level when really every little vote counts. I mean, you know, when you're talking about some of the small towns and municipalities and the counties and stuff. So when you have a certain issue that is really important and it doesn't have to be a realtor issue, that's the other thing. I mean, it can be in a lot of IEs, a lot of IEs that I've done, we've done them in Maryland and DC have been on realtor issues. Some have just been on a slew of issues for that particular candidate and we knew we wanted to get to a certain voting population and certain elections we lost by 62 votes and some we won by 62 votes and that's really what it is because the PAC contribution isn't going isn't going very far at all, especially in states with, with limits. And, and it's only going to certain things. They could put up a few more yard signs. This, you're going up to 10,000 voters in a lot of places where you can do just a mail or, or one TV commercial that runs at prime time. That's really where the focus is with IE. So you have more control over what you think is going to be in the It is. It's you all your control. You are not talking to the candidate. Bob asked me that just before, you know, on the side. You are not talking to the candidate. They know nothing about this until that first mailer drops. Then you can tell them all, all you want. I mean, you're not going to share every detail, but, you know, or they see that commercial or that radio ad. I mean, I, that's all the focus is on them. Does that kind of help a little bit? Yeah, go ahead. So, I mean, think about it, take a step back on the politics for a minute, but I, mean, I think Gavin could probably explain you too, for you as a local board. Think about the, the influence that that will portray to everybody within your municipality or county, the fact that you're not just giving an RPAC check. You went on maybe the offensive, or maybe the defensive, but you have the ability, the monetary resources, the staff to come in and shape a campaign. And at the local level, that's going to allow, people are going to stand up and take notice. And it's not just what Bill said of you handing somebody a check and shaking their hand. Now you're a player. And when you go to a city council meeting or county commissioner meeting or township trustee meeting, they're going to notice you, notice you more than they did before because you've got a whole host of services now that you are able to unleash in any type of campaign. And I think that's probably the biggest benefit, at least I see, for you, for each of you as your local board. It, it is, and take it one step further, whether you win or lose, a, a good example I can give you is there it was an election that I worked with NIR many years ago and we lost by like 50 votes. The candidate that won within a week <coughs> came to us and said, oh my God, what did you do? Cannot you do this for me the next election? And we said, well, Let's see how you are on the issues. So the other side really takes notice of it, and it does show, as Paul said, you know, becomes a real player in it. And, and I know people might be saying, oh my God, this sounds like a lot of work for the office together. You work with a vendor to do it. They'll help you design it. We're going to go together. Yeah, we'll so go that's through. all stuff that don't we'll go here. Yeah, we'll go here, here, here and here. here. So you can use these IEs for, say, school board races or levies? Well, the levies, the levies is an issue. We'll talk, we'll talk, I, my guess is it's an issue. So help, help me guys if I'm saying this right. I'm pretty sure it's an issue. There's, yeah. a, there's a whole separate, there's a whole separate $7 million for that we're gonna talk about. Right now, think of an IE with a candidate. Right, yes sir. What's the reason that we really, you're saying we don't wanna have communication with this candidate that we're supporting? So it is the, why wouldn't we have some communication to let them by law, federal law, you actually can't. <laughs> no matter what state laws, federal law, the, the federal basics are for an in, that's why independent. Yeah, and then we're going to go here first, then we'll go over here. Yeah. I just have a question. Our board covers six counties, so geographically, I think we're one of the largest boards there is. When you're talking about this amount of money, we kind of out of respect for our board and covering all these counties, are we allowed to get these monies for more than one county candidate and sure. do this at, have more than one ball we, uh, in the air at a time? In the, in the greater Salt Lake City area, Justin, who's one of uh, Meredith's counterparts, uh, they did, I think, 15 different aldermanic races in different cities and communities around the Salt Lake City area. So you could come in with a, with a package of them. I think it's I, you know, it, it ties to winability and what makes sense versus just trying to throw it all out there. But let's say you had uh, uh, you had five different units of government and you wanted to play in five different units. In fact, it actually works sometimes better because when you look at the polling, if it's a tighter geographical area, the issues are oftentimes the same issues, and you can piggyback off the polling stuff, which will. And obviously, they'd have to be candidates we would want to support anyway. Yeah. I mean, if you have worthy candidates in yeah. different counties, I mean, the monies would be available. Yep. Yeah. And, and some of it's the cost. I mean, in certain markets across the country, 
you know, $134,000 is one campaign. So it's really going to, it will depend on, you know, the, the market and what you're talking about cost-wise, too. And I'll go through, I'm going to go through just a real quick process. But was there a question over here? Go yes. ahead, Joanne. I'm from a, a small board also, and I know a couple times we've given money to people, to candidates that, that some of the members has brought in that they didn't realize we had money to give out also. But when we present them with a check, we always say, now this isn't an endorsement or supporting, like he said. We su and I don't understand if they did all this and they put on their, it was their local boards doing, how that conflicts with when you say you're not supporting that candidate. You want to, Gavin, you want to answer that question? We chose to start endorsing candidates and we just right. changed the way. So we you can set, you can choose. Sure. We were always told you can't support. We tell that. That's, that's, that's a culture in your board that was created. Uh, you know, now the PAC, it's interesting. Sometimes there's definitions on our PAC where they'll say, well, the RPAC check is not an endorsement, it's right. a contribution. Right. Uh, to most politicians, if you give them a $500 check within about 30 seconds, it's on their brochure saying, I'm endorsed by the yeah. realtors. So, but my point is, that's a cultural question. Let me, let me just explain something here real quick because I want to just get to the next step here on the IE program. If you're going to do this program, let me just show you some of the things you would wind up doing real quick. And by the way, in the end, all of this stuff is up here. And, and, and we'll try to explain a little later. A lot of this stuff is all up on the website. But here, first thing you got to do if you're going to use the independent expenditure program is you have to choose the candidate. So Joanne hit it really well. Does your association want to support somebody who has helped you uh, you want to go as far as the evidence said and sort of endorse somebody? My guess is you're going to sort of endorse somebody. Okay? That's number one. Number two is you have to develop a campaign plan. Okay? So this is where, gang, the wheels sort of come off a little. Up to now, and this is, this is really important going back to 1969-70, I keep saying this like a broken record. Up to now, we can choose a candidate because there's two candidates, A and B. And we typically all on our local boards have an interview committee. And we go, Bob, how do you feel about these issues? Sandy, how do you feel? The committee votes. The board of directors says yes. We tell our members we're going to endorse Sandy. We give Sandy an ARPEC check, and we send out a mailer to everybody or an email and say, vote for Sandy on April 7th. That's where we are today, okay? From here on out, this is new. So now that you've picked Sandy, first thing you do is develop a campaign plan. That's what Gavin had to do. You contact NAR, or you're, in, you're most likely gonna be contacting uh, Meredith, and there's a staff person at NAR that gets contacted, and one of the vendors that we have, we have a lot of vendors that do this, polling, all this other stuff, is going to contact you. So they're going to call Bob, could be Joe Good or Julian or somebody, and they're going to say, Bob, what do you want to do? And say, we, uh, we want to elect Sandy. Really, well, when's the race? If you say the race is next Tuesday, we have a problem. <laughs> Here's the other cultural change, you guys. When you only gave out an ARPEC check, you could get away with the board meeting the week before the election. Right, Gavin? Can't do that with this program. You have to start thinking 60 to 90 days out to use all the things we're going to talk about. This is another change of what we're talking about. This to me is the root of the 40 bucks. Okay? So now you want to develop campaign. So the first thing they're going to say is, how viable is Sandy? Well, we have a couple choices. A veterans in the room, it's the cousin of the board president. We've got a problem right out of the box. She's never run for office before, and she's going against an incumbent who's well-liked. Well, why are we picking Sandy? Because she's the cousin of the president. Now, guess what happens? First thing that the consultant does when he's talking to Bob, the EO, we're going to run a poll. That's one of the services, right, Gavin? First thing we're going to do is we're going to do a head-to-head -head on Sandy and maybe Susie and Joe, the incumbent. And we're going to run a head-to-head -head poll. We're going to find out that the incumbent is vulnerable, but Sandy can maybe only garnish 2% of the vote. So do we keep going, yes or no? 
Well, the other thing we do is we do issue poll. What are the hot issues in the area? Well, maybe, maybe it's the swimming pool vote. And everybody's so ticked off that you had to spend $2 million on a swimming pool and that mayor is polluted because he pushed it. And Sandy, who's an unknown right now, comes out and says, I hated that swimming pool. And I tell you, if you elect me, I'll reject that swimming pool. Guess what? Her identification goes up like a rocket. So all of a sudden, you've got an issue, but you've got an unknown candidate. So we're preparing a campaign plan. Okay, that's the next thing you do. Then you design a plan. <coughs> oh, oh, Marlon. Okay. Well, who, who's going to run the poll then? We. What we have NAR is yeah. NAR part of the campaign services program is we have an entire relationship with a pollster in D.C. And Gavin, you want to explain? You worked with Joe Good. Why don't you give a little more personal explanation? Yeah, I mean, Joe and I sat up about three or four conference calls, figured out, he tried to gauge from me what were the hot button issues, what are I here. We went back and forth, created a poll that he put out in the field, it took about a week from when we started the poll. He came back with a bunch, bunch of information, which pretty much set out the campaign plan. That's pretty much how we developed the campaign plan was from the poll, though. So, I mean, it was... Mary, Mary if you, you have some examples you want to give? To yeah, I, I've done a couple with Joe, but, and I have a lot of other colleagues who've done it. Basically, um, it's, the company is American Strategies and Target Smart, and NAR has them on contract, and they've actually been probably about five years now, I think it is. Um, and I was one of the piloted, actually, when they first did it. Joe will work with you what your issues are, and he's going to tell you the right way to tailor it, the right way the questions should be matched as far as what order, uh, how many questions? I mean, I, there was one we wanted to like 50 questions, and he said, "Forget it. You know, that's not going to work." I mean, we've had boards, you know, that have just said things like that. So, but he'll work with you. He'll ask you about your community. You know, what what are the issues that your board wants to focus on? And they'll just kind of go through it with you. And then, what is the best time? You know, to send it out. I mean, you don't want to do it during you know holiday weekend, and he'll work with you. You know, with you through that. The 60 to 90 day. The real issue with that is because. Do have people obviously all over the country who are looking to do this? So he's got a plan himself. And no, you know, Ohio's elections are this state, or Ohio's primary is this state. You know, uh, this state is, is on this state or whatever. But Joe is very, very um, whatever it is you locally want to do. He his his he has a very broad background. He, you know, and um, he can kind of just go through it with you as far as what the plan is supposed to be. But it's still it's your focus and what your issues are. So Gavin. Go, oh, yes, sir. Um, just so I, I think I understand this, I'm sure everyone else in the room here understands. By you saying that NAR has contract with these folks for polling state, for example, if we want to support a race and we contact them through a poll, out of this forty dollars, NAR is covering the cost of this poll? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very important thing that we can take back locally. Yeah. So and, and you're talking about tens of thousands of dollars yeah. that you would be paying out of pocket to pay your own pollster, that they have a certain contract with NAR. And yeah, we'll talk about a little later we'll talk about even different types of polls besides this that you can do on maybe on issue. So but I just want to make sure that everyone understands that this is this is not something that's gonna kind of have to come out of our own budget. No. Yeah. No. So Good. So Jennifer, would that be a point then that we could take back and say this is part of what your forty dollars gets you? Sure. The cost to conduct this poll. Yeah. All of these, all of these campaign services that are on your little menu here up on top, <laughs> survey, polling, modeling, direct mail. We'll talk a little more about these, but all of those are part of the campaign services budget that we were talking about. So we're we're back to you. You've got Sandy. You've done some polling. Now you're ready to write a plan. And by the way, the outside consultant helps you write the plan. So Gavin, why don't you tell everybody on these city council races, what were some of the things in the plan that came up with the 57,000? Yeah, I mean, we decided that TV was too expensive for Columbus. I mean, we were looking over $500,000 to get a TV buy of any sort. So we decided mail was gonna be the strategy. Um, the poll kind of laid out the issues that we needed to touch on. So we built a campaign plan out of these mail pieces saying, okay, one will touch on jobs, one will touch on crime. The last one will touch on just getting the guy's name out to push it at the last minute. Um, we set out when we're gonna mail those pieces out based off of the election calendar. Um, you know, and the, the poll showed us that we could find a pathway to victory through the issues that we touched upon for our guys. So, and then did, um, you use, did you use voter lists? Did yeah, voter lists or voter, I mean, not voter lists, but voter lists from NAR. They, Bill Russell, who was, um, I don't know what purpose to fill with, but it was our mail company that we used for NAR. They had the list already populated. 
Um, you know, I didn't come up with that either. We just targeted to decide, okay, to move the most amount of votes were independents for the one guy, so we picked um, Ohio's law because you either have to register as a Democrat, Republican, or um, undecided. And so we targeted all the undecided voters for the one guy and then targeted just Democrat voters for the Democrat candidates. Here's, here's another point. And I, I know for some of you they're sort of going, I ain't doing this this year, and you're getting a little lazy eyed. I, I've not lost touch. I'm going to show you how to get money besides this yet before you leave. NAR is, remember I said the campaign services thing way back when? They went out and they bought 170 million, the, the list? Uh, yeah. yeah we, we, bought, we bought and we now own a voter list. It's one of the largest voter lists in the country. That voter list is updated. To some it's not as clean as maybe as local lists are concerned, but the bottom line is, like you asked the question about polling, you own a voter list as the National Association of Realtors. So his voter list he's talking about is owned by NAR. So it can be targeted into Columbus. It can be targeted down to certain households. We do social media work. So Facebook and all the other stuff, we use social media uh, advertising for the same thing for the campaign. We use a voter activation list to get people to go out to the polls and vote. So all of these things are part of this de develop your campaign plan and now you have a budget. And you're working, by the way, with somebody out of D.C. to do all of this. If you have a local person, like a consultant you want to work with, that's great. You know, uh, the bottom line is you're working with somebody who develops the campaign plan with you. So you're not sitting there up at night trying to figure out how many postcards and all that other stuff. So in his case, it was $57,000. That then goes to an application form which is also online. It's the IE form that you fill out, okay? The form, this is really important, the form has to be signed by the O and another Realtor. Now in your case, it's not a problem, and the reason we had it set up that way, because in most states, you have to do an affidavit because you know you have to show that we're not having a communication with the candidate. You, luckily in Ohio, because you have a looser set of laws, don't have to do that. You're still going to need, and let me tell you, it is wonderful that you don't. Wonderful. Because the reverse is it's just a nightmare across the country. This is one they never thought about within the three-way agreement. Imagine, who do you think the candidate's going to talk to first? The board president, the directors? all the people who make the decision. So it almost runs contrary to the way our system is set up. So you don't have to worry about that, but you're still going to need two signatures. Forms got to be filled out. Here's the most important part. The boss man over here, Mr. Fletcher, has to sign it too, along with a realtor at the state level. Why? The two questions on the form. First one, is the state association aware of your request, yes or no? Does the state association support it, yes or no? Okay, for all the local AEs in the room that sort of going, it's my money, why are we going to the state? Here's the answer. The answer is A N A R. Oh, who makes this decision? Okay, well on your little chart here, it says state and local IEs. A little column there. And if you follow your hand along there, it says there's a little subgroup. Every week the committee meets by conference call starting in January and you go what are these people nuts <laughs> the answer is no because as Meredith says we got 50 states 50 states times what an average of four elections per state this is the first time we've gone to the local level and the state level so there's hundreds of elections so what you need to do is you notice that schedule <coughs> What you would be doing is, let's say hypothetically your race is October 1st, and let's say early elections start September 1st, where you could actually go and vote. You gotta figure September 1 backwards about 60 to 90, maybe 90 days to be safe. August, July, about June, and here's where it gets a little problem, Gavin can help here. I don't know what your filing date is, because sometimes the filing date of the candidates is really close to early election date, but somewhere in there in about that 60 days, because all of this stuff we're talking about, doing mailers, polling, all that other stuff, it takes time to do that. It takes probably 60 days. Gavin, how long did you, what was your start to finish? The 
race we were doing was nonpartisan, so the filing date was not until August for November election. But I started in July with no one who was going to run, and then once it was finalized, those guys filed. They got approved to be on the ballot. We started really moving after August, but um, August for November election is when I was starting. So AE's in the room. Just again, just future culture for you is that you need to start to identify if it's this year and some of you want to sort of say, I think I may play this year. You want to look at your dates. If you got a date in September and you got one in November, you might as well start thinking right now. The other thing you want to start thinking about is, and we'll get to the, we'll finish the form here. The other thing you want to start to think about strategically is, if I've never done this before, what committee am I going to have at the local level to do all this? And Gavin, who did who did you use at the local level to sort of run this from the layperson side? I went straight to our board of directors because we didn't have a committee set up for it, so I did through the board of directors for it. We're starting to look at trying to set up a fair steering. Yeah. So you're going to want to. You know, maybe it's that group, you know, AEs, maybe it's that group that, uh, you know, endorses candidates now, maybe that's your group, but you're going to want to think about creating culturally in your association some form of a committee. You know, it was easy on our pack, but you want to think about some type of government affairs group. Right now, you got one that probably does issues, you know, if there's a common council issue, they vote, the directors support the position. You're going to want to think of maybe a sister group or whatever that's going to help you make these decisions. I mean, think about it, Joanne, you said we didn't ever endorse. Well, you're going to want to have something in your board that is going to be the trigger to decide culturally if you want to endorse candidates. I think that's a major shift for a lot of our boards. One thing to give an RPEC check, it's another thing to go out and take it, like the gentleman said in the back, to another level of getting involved in campaigns. So culturally, I think you may want to look at that. Yes? Um, and speaking of endorsements, <coughs> maybe you could give a little advice here. We had an instance last year on a race where we had two agents running for similar races. Two, two realtors? Two realtors. So, of course, very, we liked both, so <laughs> we just gave money. But in a case like this, if there were just one, we could have looked at doing, without their knowledge, doing the IE money to endorse them for what they were running. Is, is that what we're talking about yeah. here? The, 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 you want to answer that? Or yeah, I, I think there, there, there are two separate things, although they're, I mean, if, if you're entertaining uh, financial support through our PAC, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. And as, as far as this business about we don't endorse, all we do is give out our PAC checks, I've heard that for a long time too, and and it never made any sense to me. But it, it, the longer I was here, the less sense it made. But I believe it was the there. But in this situation, you feel it, it, awkward. It was know? there, so I'm not surprised that some boards have gone under that assumption, and some boards like it that way. Uh, they 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 would prefer not to get in the endorsement game, but there's nothing to prohibit you from endorsing a candidate over another. And, and as Bill said, even if you don't, the candidate's going to say, supported by our pack or something to that effect. So it's going to get out there anyway. But if you want to take the second step, you really feel strongly about a given candidate, giving the RPAC check continues to be important because that's, that's for them to use in, in terms of what they do to get the girls elected. But then you can add on an additional level of support, and it doesn't have to be uh, a huge thing. I mean, you, in some areas of the state, taking out a half a page ad in the local paper saying the realtors of this area of the state endorse such and such and this is why, and do it without their knowledge, you know, $1,000 could go a long way. And that just makes the attempt to put something someone in the office that's sympathetic to your views, mm -hmm. more likely to happen. Okay. Because I thought we could have helped. Right. Uh, but the, I, I think the bottom line message, and I want to and I want to finish up the form of the process, then Bob, I'll get your question in a second here. I mean, bottom line is for the presidents and the staff people in the room here running boards, this is all new stuff. And you've got to have a corresponding system in place, committee wise and decision making wise to get this done. So for AEs that have GADs, it's a little easier because they're there and they know the schedule, but if you don't have a GAD, 
uh, one of the things you're going to want to look at is your race dates. And then you're going to want to have a system in place of how do you do this? How do you do Do we want to go to the next level beyond RPAC and hard dollars and actually get ourselves involved in some of these, some of these races? So let me, let me keep going here on the form. You filled out the form. The reason that the state has the two questions on there is this. NER does not want to get caught between a political quagmire between a local board and the state. Sandy's our candidate in Akron. Great candidate. Bob's lobbyist comes to him and says, the majority leader in the state senate does not like Sandy. And in fact, the majority leader likes the other person. And he has found out that the Akron board is going to support Sandy. And has turned to Bob personally and said, you'll never get a bill through the legislature as long as you support Sandy. We have a problem. Okay? And NAR doesn't want to have your problem. NAR doesn't want to pick between Akron and Ohio. NAR just simply, and, and so remember I said, who are these people? It's seven realtors, like a little subgroup every week that meets. And where are they from? They're like Bob, and they're like, who, they're Maine, California, Florida. They're wonderful folks who got an application for them. They looked at Gavin's stuff, and they got to make a decision. And, and I can tell you that, that if Bob says no, it's a yellow flag right out of the box. Okay? At the same time, I want to be very candid, and I've said this to all my former counterparts, it's not meant to be a block. It's not there. And if you do, you're going to get called on it because you're going to get asked questions of why you said no. Other thing I want to tell you on the conference call, again, for the A's of the room structurally, you're going to want to train a realtor in your association to learn how to do this stuff and ask for the money. Yeah, but who asked for the money when you were on? When I asked for it. You had, yeah. But you had realtors involved. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. In the future, because he was a test case, I can pretty much tell you when you're asking for money in these things, the realtors on the call want to hear a realtor explain it. The staff can be on the call, which is great, but they really want to know that there's a realtor leader there that sort of says, yeah, it's a city council person, and they can talk realtor to realtor. So again, for the staff people, you're going to want to develop somebody in your board maybe longer term who has a skill set in being able to understand this stuff and ask for the money and answer the question. So the committee looks at it. They approve it on a week-by-week -week basis. The plan is approved, and then things are implemented, like Gavin said, you know, we're, we're down to the races. You're also going to need, this is another practice tip for the staff here, you're going to need somebody on your end. If you don't have a Gavin, you're going to have somebody who's going to be the boots on the ground working with the vendors. Because your worst nightmare is Washington, D.C. running your aldermanic race in Cincinnati. They don't know if you have a palm tree on your street or an elm tree, you know. The bottom line is everything you approve, that, that Gavin's group approved, every one of those postcards were signed off by the board. So that nobody can ever come back and say that all this stuff that we bought, we never got to see before it got mailed out. So you, like ads, postcards, you signed off on everything. Yeah, every single yeah. Facebook <laughs> ad stuff. So I know it's sounding a little more labor intensive, but it's the only way the pro program can work is because if you don't have your fingers and hands on it, it's not going to work. It's your, it's your campaign because you have to be telling your members to where to go. So the form gets filled out. We submit it. goes into NAR. It's approved. Money typically will go to two spots. In his case, he used the 527 of NAR. I said earlier what I'd recommend here, and I think this is where the boards and Bob and Fletch and his team, I think you need to sit down and take a look at it. When I left Wisconsin, one of the things we were doing is we were looking at, our law requires us to form a little group, but we still had to have a name and a treasurer and all the rest of the stuff. One of the things you may want to start to look at for Ohio is one name or one 527 or whatever for the whole state. So it's uh, Ohio homeowners for better prosperity or something. And I only suggest it only because when you start to look at local races, state races, mayor races, you remember what, remember what Paul was saying? He said, when they know you're out there, they're going to respect you more. Instead of having 27 different brands 
trying to use this program, you may want to consider just one brand name. So every mayor, every alderman, every state assembly person, every senator knows it's the realtors. Because they don't know the difference between a local board and the state. They just know it's the realtors. So I don't, if you guys, I don't know if you've thought about this, but it's a strategic question you have to look at because if you create it here, the check may be written here versus the way they did it with the 527 there. The other thing on NAR, um, we did races all over the country. And in some cases, the NAR name, while it's a very nice name, didn't jive real well with a local race. Why is a national organization in the mayor's race in Edmond, Washington with 16,000 people? In Miami, they used a more subtle name. They used, it was sort of like uh, Miami Folks for Better Neighborhoods or something. Look, they'll find out about you because there's always an election report. They'll know who it is eventually, but maybe it just isn't so direct. You may want to look at it from a more subtle standpoint. I'm going to stop here on IEs. Meredith may have an additional comment or two from her experience. This is, trust me, we're not going to spend this much time in every program because this is the new one. But where are we? Besides glazed eyes, have to go to the bathroom and hungry, where are we? <laughs> yes, Marlon. I'd like to know how many boards in the state of Ohio have a governmental affairs director either paid or not paid. Hmm. Five, I think. And what boards would those be? Well, we have one in Cincinnati, okay. in Columbus, in Cleveland, in Akron, uh, in Stark County, and I think that is it. We have other in we have other staff members at the local level who, who spend some time in the area of government affairs but do other things like Dayton. And a majority of those case staff or yeah. or could they be the executive officer <coughs> is also that person too? If there is no specific person who's assigned that task it always falls to the executive okay. <laughs> <laughs> Questions more on the idea. Yes. Before we get off the yeah, and we can always come back. The race back there was a fifty-six fifty-six thousand dollar number. Is that considered a fairly substantial one? Because I'm looking at one hundred forty-four thousand for the whole state. And we're spending a lot of time. Fifty-six thousand could be done, you know, in a week, and we're done for the year. Yeah. 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 The question is, was the fifty-six thousand fairly substantial? I argue yes, yeah. because it was a test case. In fact, your original proposal was even higher. It was 100000 It was 100000 So I would argue that it's probably higher than what it normally would be, um, simply because we did a test, a series of test cases. I don't think they'll be as high as that. Now, one more time, everybody. This is a really important point. He did an IE, which is part of the half of the 137. The gentleman in the back said, so we could do some polling, or maybe we could do some other campaign services like advertising, websites, social media, voter lists, voter registration. Those are all, those all can be separate requests. This is where, and I, 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 I don't know how to say it, because it's been very hard for me to comprehend it. Think of it this way. The IE is one thing. You remember I said, well, if you do an IE, you do these things. Polling, voter list, social media. Those are all services that NAR provides that goes against that allocation if you use them. <coughs> if you don't want to do an IE and you simply want to run a campaign and use campaign services, you can do that and make a request just for those services that has nothing to do with the 137,000 that's allocated to Ohio. Did I say that right? About. Well, tell me if I said it wrong. Am I close? Yeah. Okay. Because <laughs> I'm now on camera. Would you say so. that again, please? <laughs> no. Is the camera running? Did we ask the realtors to raise their hands again? <laughs> the, the, this is, I seriously, this is where Listen to these words. Campaign direct mail services. 
campaign automated phone banks and phone calls, campaign advertising services, campaign website social media, voter list, count tool, activation network, voter registration initiative, consultant campaign management. All of the things I'm just mentioning here are under this campaign services menu that are part of, and I think the gentleman in the back said it so well, that's part of the $40. So you may want to just do, a, I mean, to bring this down, Tom, real simply, you may want to just simply do a mayor's race, and the only thing you want to do this year is a poll. But Gavin and Paul and everybody else tell me, if the Board of Realtors did a poll, and they said, we want to do a poll, and we're going to let the candidate know, but we want to do it as an in-kind contribution, is that what you do in Ohio? So that poll has a value to it. Let's say it's $3,000. And the only thing you want to do this year is you're going to start small. You're not going to do the whole banana here. You're going to start with one campaign service. And you may want to just simply do a poll and let the mayor know how the mayor is doing on a head-to-head. -head. But if you let the mayor know that, it's like giving a cash contribution to the, mayor, to the mayor. So you can use one of the campaign services maybe on a limited basis. So. The gads in the room and staff, to, I want to make sure I'm saying this right under Ohio law. In Wisconsin, we could do a poll. We could look at it internally and never share it, which would be great for us, because let's say we wanted to destroy the other guy. We just wanted the information. Or we said, no, no, it's a calculated thing we want to do, and we're going to give it. Oh, and by the way, because it's so good, we're going to put it in the newspaper. Realtors poll says Bob up by 12 points. You've seen those in the paper? It's a, it's a nice way to give something to a candidate without giving them an RPAC check. We're doing it in a different way because having that headline, Realtors poll 10 days out before the election goes Bob up by 10 points, could put Bob over the top. And you now understand why when the Realtors came at the May meeting and said, could you put this all into one paragraph? <laughs> Long paragraph. So you're saying the Realtors poll is a free service from NAR? It's... Or is the word charged back to 134000 for the poll of $3,000? No, it's not charged back. There, there are certain portions that fit under that $7 million of the independent expenditure, which is that 134, and, and it will... It's going to vary a little bit, and that's why Jerry Allen, who's the staff person, and Julian, um, who's new with NAR, they'll work with you to figure out which portions fit under that IE application, uh, allocation versus which don't. So if, if you, services if, if, go against the preparation for the application for the program, the mailers. Actually, what, what would happen if you're applying for an IE request, those two polls would be part against your IE allocation. Oh, yeah. Remember, remember his $57,000? That, that included that polling. poll head-to-head -head and issue poll. I'm talking like separate. Now let me tell you where this gets really complex. We're not going to go through it because you, your heads will be spinning. There are some states that have polling services on their own and campaign services, SGS, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Florida, whatever. You remember Meredith talked about all these vendors that NAR has and we went out and contracted? Well, we have some parts of the country where they'll come to us and say, we want to use our own pollster. We don't want to use your pollster. And how will that apply against our independent expenditure? Anything that is a non-communication tool is charged against your IE. Now, I've really confused you. You don't have to worry about it because it's not an issue here. But it's sort of like, did you hear Gavin say, did you use your own mailhouse? Uh, for one of the ones we did. Okay. They did their own mail. That's okay. You don't have to use the NER mailhouse because it's a more effective way to do it. So in some of our states, and Fletch, you know this, in some of our states, they have sophisticated tools that any already has, and we've been bumping up against that, and I've been we've been trying to work out a deal where, with SGS and, and uh, Joel and their people, um, that basically maybe we do this, you do that, and it works out really well and everybody wins. And the reason, gang, again, non-relevant to you is, those states that have those services, they're paying for that in their state dues. They're not getting it for free. The realtors are paying for it in their state dues. So my answer to that is, you know, use both because your members are paying for it at both the state level and the and the national level. Yes, Tom. 
so far in everything in your presentation. I mean, maybe this is not as complicated as it sounds, but it sure seems complicated. And to train a individual or an AE or someone to be <coughs> on top of all of this, everything that you've said and all these procedures so far, it seems a little overwhelming. For someone to grasp this, or I mean, it seems like this is going to have to be a lot more training. Um, but the other thing is that there's only five gaps that we have throughout the state. I mean, maybe there should be more that we go to, or maybe uh, I don't know what the, an answer is, but it just seems more complicated. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. And some boards are smaller, so. Where are they going to find that funding or making that's up beyond the scope of their aid? Well, I, I'll give you, and I'm not going to suggest it here, but uh, in Wisconsin we had eight GADs. We had different relationships. At an election time, the GADs covered areas outside of their own boards because state dues were paying for part of their salaries and all the rest of the stuff. I don't, you know, I really believe, I'm going to say it as a broken record one more time, you have to have my Realtor Party Ohio. I mean, I remember almost two hours ago, I said, you're going to walk out the door and understand the complexity of this. You're now, Tom, what you just said is exactly what this PAG did to put us to this next level, which 98% of our folks don't do it already. And then you wonder why they were confused and mad when they voted for 40 bucks, because they had no clue what the program worked. So from a capacity standpoint, you are not alone. And it's one of the reasons why I suppose my title is political strategic planning is the state and the boards have to come together and look at Ohio, look at its jurisdictions, and decide, and let's just say it for the fun of it, there's a mayor in XYZ town and there's not a GAD. But the mayor is so important because he or she is so anti-realtor that if you ignore that race, you'd be doing harm to the rest of the cities in Ohio. Well, somebody's got to take that on, either the state or maybe a local GAD or a partnership or whatever, but that's really what the strategic planning process is all about. I, I would argue that the goal in Ohio is, is that by 2013, maybe five local boards are now using the campaign services program of NAR. And maybe by 14, 10 are. But yep. does NAR see that as a success then if so few boards are actually utilizing the money? You know, I mean, I can get excited about this and say this sounds really awesome and amazing, but the fact is, as I've taken uh, time away from my clients in office today, and to get me to donate what seems like hours of my time to this without pay, is asking a lot. Right. So for me to go back and say, okay, Realtor Sally, I want you to donate, okay, like 40 hours a month to doing this because it sounds like that's what's going to pay without pay. And by the way, we're not going to pay your mileage either, um, you know, <laughs> or your cell phone bill. Um, that's asking a lot. Right. I mean, that really is to, yeah. to get the monies back from NAR that a lot of people have the perception that they were going to get back. Well, we have, we have not touched the other three quarters of the program of which you can get money back without doing any of this. This is the only new program that, that NAR has right now, which is the independent expenditure program and the campaign services part. And, and why we're spending all the way up to lunch, and then we'll take our break, is that this is the cultural change of what the $40 is about in my mind. It's huge. It's exactly where we were 45 years ago that when not one local board or state association had a political action committee. And somebody had to start it and do it. All I'm just telling you is the landscape for politics today has changed to the point where if you don't do these types of things, somebody will do them to you. And I don't have an answer for you because I can tell you in Wisconsin, I'm, I'm with you 100%, five boards in the state out of 24 have the capability of doing this. And I told my successor, Mike Theo, you got to figure out a way because if the mayor in Racine is a real bad dude, and he does something bad, mayors talk to each other, and if there's a bad sign ordinance in Racine, there'll be a bad one in Kenosha, Appleton, Stevens Point, everywhere else, and we gotta figure out a way to take it down. And that's why I just think collectively, Bob, Ohio and the boards have to come together and say, with all this new stuff,
how are we going to do this with just five GADs and a state staff and volunteers? And so I think strategically, you have to rethink it. Go ahead. Uh, and I would say to ease your mind a little bit, the stuff we'll talk about this afternoon, there are a lot of other ways to get that, what I would call it indirectly politically being involved, you know, doing grants. And, and there are a bunch yeah. of you, and I'm going to call you out, who have done housing opportunity grants and smart growth grants. Actually, you guys haven't done smart growth. So we'll talk about that. But diversity grants. Other ways to get your local electeds involved and aware so that mayor doesn't go off and start doing some random thing that's going to hurt realtors. That's that had programs that have actually existed at NAR for many years, and a lot part of the $40 went to, and what would it has the best comment ever, to put the programs on steroids. There's a lot more money, and it's ways to get a $5,000 grant. If you're a board of $1,000, you know, 1,000 members, $5,000 grant, you just that's your $40 right there. So there are other ways that we can kind of work through it, because I know the IE stuff is, is it's complicated. It's not that complicated, though. I mean, and we can break it down. And with the NAR staff and with my help and with other, you know, with your staff in Ohio, there are ways to make it simpler. But there's a lot of other things that we can do to just kind of ease ease you a little we bit. Will, you know, with some of when we get through lunch, we're going to go to the left side of that menu and do not nowhere near as detailed as this. Talk about housing opportunity grants. There's just a ton of stuff there that are, you know, everything from a foreclosure seminar that you can put on in your town, and the NAR will give you 2,500 bucks to fund it, or a diversity grant, or a class, or there's a lot of community-based programs that are under here, too, that uh, uh, have been around a while. In fact, some of you have used them. Uh, RPAC fundraising grants. I mean, there's ways to get that seven to $8,000 back that I was mentioning in the beginning. This one, though, this one is so big and so complex that as I go around the country, the only way I can explain it is going through it step by step. And in answer to your question, I think your, your question about does NAR understand, I'm, I, I got open season on that yet. I do, because when you go to NAR, what happens is they have this director's being a big screen up there, and it says the broker involvement program, and they got these graphs, and if they aren't going this way, you know, it doesn't. It's like RPAC. You know, it's like it's like realtors selling houses. You know, your sides, you count your sides. Well, NAR the same way. And in this one, I've told Mo and I've told Dale and I've told everybody, you are going to be surprised at how many are not yet ready to move to the next level because this is an area where it is very complex. No, I think we are. I think I think that the funds. I mean, in time, you know, it's just it's just that may be why you know. You know, whereas NARs like had time to develop this thought process, right. this is being thrown on, you know, our laps, and then just like NAR took time to develop it, now OAR and Ohio Realtors and all the other states need time to like say, okay, so this is, you know, the new way of politics. So right. we need time to say, okay, so maybe that just becomes something the boards individually need to discuss. And okay, I'll put my application in. I'll have to tell Tim Gleason, okay, Tim. I'm leaving you and I'm going to be a GAD or whatever that is, you know, so I can go out and be a political campaign or whatever sure. thingy for, for my board. But, you know, so we need time to yeah. grow into that. And it I, sounds exciting, it sounds complicated, but it just sounds like something we haven't yet planned for. Yeah, you, you, know? you Did everybody hear, hear that? I think that's the perfect thing, we'll, and then we'll take a break. You haven't planned for it because you haven't understood it, and it hasn't been presented well, okay? And that's my job, is to get it out in the field. So I can tell you in every state I've been, what comes out of it is, is typically Fletch and the A, they all get together, they go, we need a follow-up. And this is what Meredith's role here is to work with you. We need a follow-up to sit down and say, now that we have all the toys, how are we going to use these toys? How are we going to use them effectively in Ohio? We've only got five GADs and, you know, a lot of bunch of boards here and there. How are we going to affect them? do it in Ohio, where in California they may go a lot faster because they have more resources. And then my story in Iowa, they're behind you. So every state in the country has a different sophistication level, a different election law. And yeah, NAR took a couple years to sort of put this all together on the history lesson, and now they've rolled it out. And uh, it's going to be a slow rollout, only I think on this part, the IE and campaign services. What you're going to hear from Meredith this afternoon, many of you have already done before. And the rest of it's like raising RPAC money, using grants for housing, nice easy stuff that, yes, this year you can still get money out of it to justify the dues for 012. So thank you. Your comments are